there is one game we all play and that game is called Real Life. Not everyone is good at it, but some of us are. Real Life is an open world game with endless possibilities. And after all, only the uncultured spend their day-to-day -day life in just one country. So join me in my life of leisure as I explore the best games for the handheld around the world. Super Bloody Mario, the biggest icon in gaming history. If I think of Mario, I think of one word, and that word is fun. And if you are not a fan of Mario, in my opinion, you must be dead inside. For the past 30 years, game franchises have come and gone, but Mario is here to stay. Most of his games, to this day, are always innovative and refreshing with the exception of the new Super Mario Bros. series that is, which I think they went a bit overboard on. Look at how different the majority of the main series games are. I'll show you just a few so you can take a look at the quantum leaps in gameplay style. So much bloody diversity! What a franchise! And when you think you've already seen it all, there is always something new and innovative. A lot of idiots like Adolf Hitler and nonces like Joseph Fritzl have given moustaches a bad name. And it has been down to great men such as myself and Super Mario to help try and restore moustaches prestige. Yeah. So, as I have been saying, apart from the simple fun, the other great thing about Mario is the amount of diversity and constant innovation. However, over the past 20 years, one thing sadly never changes, and that is the same recycled bloody story presented over and over again. 95% of the time, the story is exactly the same. Mario must save the princess from Bowser, generic as bloody FIFA. Yawn, yawn, yawn. They have different and engaging stories within the Mario RPGs, so why can they not bloody do it with the main series games? When I was a child, to be honest, however, they did. On the original Game Boy, we received Super Mario Land 1, 2 and 3. Each game very different from the next, and each had completely different stories from the generic Mario vs Bowser crap. So in today's episode, we are going to be looking at the first entry in this series, Super Mario Land. Super Mario Land was released in 1989. It was my first ever Game Boy game, and unlike other Mario games, which take place in the Mushroom Kingdom, Super Mario Land is set in Sarasa Land and drawn in line art. This time Mario pursues Princess Daisy in her debut rather than the series standard damsel in distress, Princess Peach. Daisy has been kidnapped by Tatanga, a mysterious monster from out of space. Ancient bloody aliens. The world of Sarasaland consists of four kingdoms named Birabuto, Mudo, Eastern and Chai. No need to say, but Mario has to visit them all in order to reach and defeat Tatanga. Gameplay wise, most of the generic conventions of 2D side scrolling Mario games are carried across from the NES. There are lots of twists, however, that separate this game from the pack. In this game, Koopa Trooper shells explode rather than slide when you jump on them, and Mario throws bouncing balls rather than fireballs. One app power ups are depicted as hearts rather than traditional mushrooms, and at the end of each level, you're met with a platforming challenge. Some elements though are the same as ever, such as blocks suspended in mid-air, pipes that lead to other areas and Goomba enemies. Speaking of gameplay differences, 
what I have just mentioned is the tip of the iceberg, really, as this game has bloody shooter sections. For the first and only time in any main series Mario game, Mario gets to pilot airplanes and submarines. Even when you get to the final boss battle, you have the pleasure of destroying him with aeroplane missiles. Graphically, as mentioned earlier, the game is drawn in line art. Each of the four worlds you get to explore are very distinct from each other, and each have different native enemies inhabiting them. The first world, Birubukto, has an ancient Egyptian feeling to it. You see sphinxes in the early stages of it, and as you go through the area, you end up inside a hieroglyphics ridden tomb and fight a bloody living sphinx named King Tototomesu. The second world is sea themed. The first stage of it is along a coast, then the later stages are underwater in your submarine. The boss of this section appears to be an ill tempered, mutated seahorse. In the third world, as opposed to having killer pirate Somalians, this world is full of bloody killer Easter Island heads. This section is a rocky area of the game. The boss of the area is an Easter Island head that throws rocks. Some nice diverse bosses in this game. The final world appears to be in a far eastern setting. This area conjures up imagery in my head such as chopsticks, special fried rice and typhoid. The music complements this area perfectly, along with the bamboo canes in the background. The final stage finds you dogfighting in disguise in the second shooter section of the game. The game culminates with two final boss battles, firstly against the Cloud with a passion for violence, then the final fight against Tatanga himself. All the music in this game is as good as in any Mario game really. I wonder why Nintendo haven't reused the music from this game in future Mario games and completely forgotten about villains such as Tatanga. We constantly get remixes in today's Mario games of tracks from the likes of Super Mario Bros, Super Mario Bros 3 and Super Mario World etc, but Nintendo do not even seem to care about the heritage of this one. Most of the signatures of this game seem to have been completely forgotten in time. Even Princess Daisy only seems to get to play tennis, golf and race go-karts really these days. However, Nintendo had recently paid homage to Super Mario Land ever so slightly. Remixes of some of the music from the game can be heard in the latest Super Smash Bros. games. I would have personally preferred it within a Mario game, but it's better than nothing, eh? So, overall, Mario's first adventure on the Game Boy was a decent one and the storyline and setting is a breath of fresh air from the usual Mushroom Kingdom Groundhog Day bullcrap. The gameplay itself is mostly the traditional Mario style, however it does have enough interesting twists to make this game fresh and unique and stand alone on its own. My only small complaint was this game was about half the length of the other Mario games I experienced around that time. However, since it was the plumber's first outing on the Game Boy, I'll give this game a massive thumbs up. If you haven't already tried this game, I urge you to give it a go. Cheerio! Thank you for watching today's video. If you are brand new to my channel, then please hit the subscribe button as I release retro reviews of classic games every single week. Please like and comment as every little helps and please feel free to share this video with your friends on social media. If you want to see if the original Game Boy is still worth using today then hit the Game Boy annotation. Want to learn about a movie licensed game which is actually good then hit the Flintstones annotation. Ta ta and farewell.